Good morning and happy Sabbath. It's a wonderful blessing to be able to be here in Canada together with you. Uh, my wife and I have looked forward to these days here in Canada. Um, my name is Daniel and I was born in New Zealand. Some people say that's the end of the world. Uh, we that live in New Zealand, we know better. It's the beginning of the world actually. And I grew up there and uh, till I was 10 years old and then we as a family uh, moved back to Holland. My parents are actually Dutch and so I lived quite a number of years in, in Holland, a little country in Europe, a lot of people, 16 million people in a little uh, space of land. Uh, but then through, uh, I believe, through divine uh, leadings, I ended up in Norway together with my wife. She is from Norway and you just met her a moment ago during the ser song service. And uh, we have been working in ministry together. Uh, we have a little ministry together called Living Water. And for the last um, eight, nine years, we've been traveling and ministering. Actually, just this last week, I had my spiritual birthday um, as I have been baptized about 10 years ago. So I was very happy for that. Uh, we're very happy to be here. It's a great blessing to be able to minister together with Amazing Discoveries, a ministry that we've always looked up to and um, I know that they are doing a powerful work in many different countries. And so we're happy to be part of this. And um, before we open God's word together, we wanna have a word of prayer. So I invite you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for blessing us this morning, for being with us and for leading us again to a beautiful Sabbath and we I want to pray that you will guide us and lead us in this coming presentation, this study, as we open your word. May you speak to us through your Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, our presentation this morning is entitled, The Parable of the Fig Tree and the Rest of the Story. This is part of a larger series with an overall title of, For Such a Time as This. I believe that we are indeed in this world for such a time as this. God has a specific plan and a special purpose for each one of us, and we want to discover that together as we explore God's Word through the course of these presentations. Our presentation this morning is an exciting one. I look forward to it. The parable of the fig tree and the rest of the story. During this series, we're going to study parables. We're going to study prophecies. We're going to study passages in God's Word that pinpoint our identity and mission for such a time as this. So if you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to turn to the book of Luke, the book of Luke, the third gospel book, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and turn to chapter 13, where we encounter the parable of the fig tree, the parable of the fig tree. And I've titled it the parable of the fig tree and the rest of the story because you will find that this parable is not a completed parable. This is an unfinished parable. And I believe that each one of us here today is to finish, is going to finish that parable in one way or the other. And so let us have a look at this parable as we compare it with some amazing prophecies in God's word. And let's endeavor to enter into this parable, enter into this story together this morning. So if you have your Bibles, Luke 13, and I'm going to begin to read in verse 6. Luke chapter 13, beginning in verse 6. He also spoke this parable. These are the words of Jesus. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and found none. Cut it down, why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit, well, but if not, after that you can cut it down. The parable of the fig tree. We read about a fig tree that is being investigated. The man that owns the tree is seeking for fruit, which of course can be expected. But does he find any fruit? No, he doesn't. He doesn't find any fruit. Year after year, he returns to that fig tree and there is no fruit to be found. And so he makes the decision, well, if this, fruit, if this tree is not going to bear fruit, there's no reason for this tree to be here, to exist. And so he decides to cut it down. But then there's a second character that comes into the story. And that is the dresser, the caretaker of the tree. 
And the caretaker of the tree says, but let it, let, it, let it alone for one more year and I will do everything I can. I will fertilize this tree. I will bestow my care upon this tree. And then next year, if it is bearing fruit, then well, but if not, then you can cut it down. So in other words, there's a year of investigation going on. And then the parable abruptly stops. We don't know the rest of the story. We're just left in the open. What happened to that fig tree? Was it cut down or did it continue to exist? We're going to go on a journey together in Bible prophecy and see if we can learn a little bit more about this parable and specifically how this parable applies to your life and my life today. And so before we go to some passages in scripture, I would like to share, you, share with you from the book Christ Object Lessons, which is, by the way, a powerful book on the parables of Jesus. And in this book, Christ Object Lessons, on page 214, we have a clear and beautiful explanation of the characters that are involved in this parable. So listen carefully as I read. Christ's hearers could not misunderstand the application of his words. David had sung, and that's of course referring to the words of Jesus. David had sung of Israel as the vine brought out of Egypt. Isaiah had written, the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. The generation to whom the Savior had come were represented by the fig tree in the Lord's vineyard within the circle of his special care and blessing. So the fig tree is none other than Israel. It is a representation of the nation of Israel. They are under the special care of the father of their heavenly father. Now, a little bit on in the same chapter, in, on page 216 of the same book, the same chapter, it says the owner of the dresser of the vineyard are one, uh, sorry, the owner and the dresser of the vineyard are one in their interest in the fig tree. So the father and the son were one in their love for the chosen people. Christ was saying to his hearers that increased opportunities would be given them. Every means that the love of God could devise would be put in operation that they might become trees of righteousness, bringing forth fruit for the blessing of the world. So we see clearly here identified the characters in this story. The fig tree is none other than the nation of Israel. The owner of the fig tree is God the Father, and the dresser or caretaker of the fig tree is Jesus Christ the Son. And in the Christ Object Lessons in this book, it makes it plain that the Father and, or the, the, father and the Son, or the owner and the dresser, are one in their care for the fig tree. And so the decision is made, give it another year, and we will do everything we can to nourish this tree. We will do everything we can to pour our blessings upon the nation of Israel so that they will do what they were purposed to do. And what was the nation of Israel purposed to do? They were purposed to be a light to the Gentiles. They were purposed to put on display the very character of God. Sad to say, this was not the reality for most of the Jews. As a matter of fact, they had settled for a lifeless, traditional, and cold system of works rather than a vital, reviving, and living faith. They bore no fruit, and they had forgotten the blessings that God had lavished upon them. Just think of the story of Israel. They were brought out of captivity. They were brought out of Egypt. They were led through the Red Sea. They were led into the wilderness where God sustained them and, 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 and kept them in his hand, in the palm of his hand for 40 years. They were guided into the promised land. There was the cloud of, 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 of the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night that led them through that wilderness experience. God rained manna down from heaven every day to feed them. He overthrew their enemies in Canaan, though they were few in number. God made the walls of Jericho come down, and he, he, he defeated the nations so that they could inherit the promised land. And yet, despite of all these blessings that God lavished upon his people, still they turned away from him and would rather go after the, uh, after the pagan nations around them. They would rather follow in the ways of the heathens than follow the living God that had called them and had given them a special identity and mission. It's a sad story, and of course there are, there are chapters of, of revival and reformation that we, that we read about in the story of Israel, but in the, in, in, the, in the long run, in the bigger picture, we see that they turned away 
from the calling that God had given to them. When we come down to the time that Jesus himself walked on this earth amongst his brethren, amongst the Jews, we read about a parable that he spoke in, Luke, uh, in Matthew chapter 21, and I invite you to turn there, which really depicts the history of the Jews as a nation. Turn to this other parable in Matthew chapter 21, and Jesus illustrated the history of Israel as a chosen people through this parable. Matthew chapter 21, and we will begin in verse 33. It's a similar parable as to the one we just read, also talking about the nation Israel and their history. Matthew chapter 21, and I'll begin reading in verse 33. Here another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower, and he leased it to vine dresses and went into a far country. So in the, other, in the first parable that we read, we read about a fig tree. In this parable, we read about a vineyard. And both are representations of the nation of Israel. Listen to how it continues, verse 34. Now, when vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dresses that they might receive its fruit. Just like the owner of the fig tree wanted to see fruit on the fig tree, so here the owner of the vineyard wants to see fruit in the vineyard. And so he sends his servants. Verse 35. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did likewise to them. You see, this is, this is encapsulating the history of Israel. Prophet after prophet after prophet was sent to them and ministered to the people, but oftentimes they were rejected. Think about Ezekiel. Think about Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. Even when Jeremiah predicted that the king of the north was going to come, the king of Babylon, and invade the country, they refused to listen to the prophet and they put him in the prison house, in the court of the, of the prison, even when his prophecy was coming to pass. The Babylonians had surrounded the city of Jerusalem and the prophet that predicted that would come to pass was in prison. They rejected the, the, the very counsel of God. They rejected the messengers of God. Look at how the parable continues in verse 37. Then last of all, he sent, who did he send? His son to them, saying, they will respect my son. Of course, this is referring to Jesus himself. Jesus, the Son of God, came amongst them. Verse 38, But when the vine dressers saw the Son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Remember, Jesus was killed just outside of Jerusalem. This is a prophecy that Jesus is weaving into this parable. He knows that very soon his life is going to be ended by the very ones that he came to bless and minister to. Now, verse 40, Jesus asks a question, a very powerful, important question. He says, therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? Now, take notice of the answer of the scribes and the Pharisees that Jesus is speaking this parable to. The very ones that would, in just days away, just weeks away, would be responsible for his death. Verse 41, they said to him, he would destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dresses who will render to him the fruits in their seasons. Now they are actually casting judgment upon themselves, are they not? They're saying, well, he will destroy those wicked workers, those wicked vine dressers. Now look at verse 42, Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. He's referring to himself as the stone, the cornerstone, the rock of ages. Verse 43 continues, Jesus says, Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you, referring to the Jew, Jewish nation, and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. Verse 44, and whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. And in verse 45, now they're starting to think, hey, wait a minute, is Jesus talking to us? Is he talking about us? And it says, now when the chief priests and Pharisees heard this parable, they perceived that he was speaking of them. 
But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes because they took him for a prophet. Fascinating parable. Fascinating parable. Jesus is depicting what would be done to him and what was going to happen to the Jews as a nation. He says in verse 43, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. But their own judgment was even more severe than the judgment of God because when they killed the son, when they crucified Jesus Christ, they still received a period of mercy in which God lavished his blessing upon them. Remember that when the disciples received the Holy Spirit from heaven on the day of Pentecost, which was the first place where they ministered? It was Jerusalem. They didn't go to the uttermost parts of the earth. They didn't go to Samaria. They didn't go to, uh, to Judea. They did later on, but the first place where the disciples ministered was in Jerusalem. It's like the parable of the fig tree that received one more year in which the vine dresser did everything. The dresser did everything that was in his power to make that tree bear fruit. And so even when the Son of God was crucified, God did everything in His power. Jesus did everything in His power by sending the Holy Spirit to the Jews as a nation, ministering to them and trying to win their hearts. Now, if you go to a prophecy which is found in the book of Daniel, it explains a little bit about what happened during that time. If you turn to Daniel chapter 9, some of you will be familiar with this prophecy, others maybe will not be. I'm going to give a little overview of this prophecy, and I want to particularly highlight a period that is mentioned here regarding the Jews as a nation. Now, Daniel is, uh, was a prophet, and uh, he was a captive in Babylon when he wrote his book. Uh, the book of Daniel contains a lot of prophecies that deal with uh, end-time events, apocalyptic prophecies, and a powerful um, prophecies for the very times in which we're living. And in Daniel chapter 9, we have a prophecy regarding the nation of Israel. Now, the reason why Daniel and his, uh, his uh, fellow men, the Jews as a nation, were in Babylon was because they had turned away from God and God had to withdraw his protection from them and they were now under the authority of the king of the north, under the authority of Babylon. And while they were in captivity there, Daniel is pleading for his people and Daniel chapter 9 is basically this incredible prayer of this prophet for the release of the Jews as a nation. And then Gabriel, this great and mighty angel, comes down from heaven and relates to the prophet Daniel regarding a prophecy about his very people, the Jews, the Hebrews. And let's pick it up there in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24. These are the words of Gabriel, the angel, to Daniel, the prophet. In verse 24, it says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. The question is, what was to happen during those 70 weeks? Well, we continue to read. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. If we would have to summarize all those events, we could say basically they had to turn around. They had to turn around. They were heading in a specific direction, and they had to turn around and turn back to God accept his blessings, realize and recognize the blessings of God and be that nation that God had ordained them to be that will put on display the very character of God. And we have a time period that is given to them to do this. God has already, uh, in his mercy, led them into captivity for them to see the situation uh, of what life is like without him, without his protection. But they were going to receive a second chance. They would be released from captivity to go and restore Jerusalem and restore the country of Israel. And they would receive a period of time, which is here referred to in verse 24, 70 weeks. Now those 70 weeks, that's a prophetic time period that we're dealing with, and in Bible prophecy, many Bible scholars have recognized this, a, a day in Bible prophecy is a literal year, a prophetic day is a literal year. So you take 70 weeks, which is 490 days, and we're talking here about 490 literal years. This was the time period that the Jewish nation received. Now, what is the beginning date of that time period? Well, you go to verse 25, the very next verse in Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, it says, Now therefore, 
uh, understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks, the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. It's referring to the building, the going forth of the command, the command to rebuild Jerusalem. And then it talks about um, some other prophecies that would happen within this 70-week prophecy regarding the Messiah and other events. It's actually a powerful prophecy if you go into the depth of Daniel 9 regarding the very coming of the Messiah and what would happen to Christ. But here I'd like to focus on this 70-week period, this 490 years. It would begin with the command to rebuild Jerusalem, which was given in 457 B.C., and if you take that date, 457 BC, and you count 490 years, you end up in the year 34 AD, 34 AD. The question then is, what happened in 34 AD? Well, that was shortly after the crucifixion of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus, which happened in 31 AD. As a matter of fact, it was three and a half years later. Now, when you connect that back to the parable that we began with, the parable of the fig tree, the fig tree is not bearing fruit. And the owner says, well, if it's not bearing fruit, we might as well cut it down. The dresser says, give it one more year, and I will do everything in my might during this year to make this tree bear forth fruit. The fig tree is a representation of Israel, and the care that is bestowed upon the fig tree is the care of the owner and the dresser, God the Father and Christ the Son. Now think about this, the nation of Israel refused the prophets over and over again, and then when the Son was sent, Jesus Christ, they crucified him, they nailed him to a tree. But even when they crucified the Son of God, God still said, I'll give them another year. As a matter of fact, I'll give them three and a half years, according to the prophecy of Daniel 9. And during this period, I will lavish my care upon them. Just like the dresser said, I'm going to do everything in my might to make this tree bear forth fruit. God is now pouring his Holy Spirit, where? Upon Jerusalem. That's where the disciples began to preach the word of God. That's where many turned to the Lord. Praise God that not, not the entire nation refused the, the invitation of Christ. As a matter of fact, many were baptized. You will remember the day of Pentecost. Many hearts were, be, were, were, were surrendered to God as they saw what they had done and they saw the power of God in their midst through the disciples. And so we have this care bestowed upon the nation during these three and a half years after the crucifixion of Jesus, powerful preaching through the disciples as they are anointed on, from high, and miracles were wrought in their midst in Jerusalem. They saw the power of the Holy Spirit working. But what happened at the end of those three and a half years, or what happened at the termination of the 70-week prophecy of Daniel 9? Well, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 7, and we're going to go to the, to the event that ended the 70-week prophecy, Acts chapter 7, and there we read about a powerful disciple of Jesus by the name of Stephen, a powerful apostle that preached with great strength in Jerusalem, and many hearts were won to the Lord through his ministry. And he was taken before the council of the Jews, and they accused him of many things. And we read actually in, in, in Acts chapter 7 and 8, and you can read it later on, about the defense of Stephen as he is brought before the council of the Jews, as they are accusing him of preaching the name of Jesus. And what he basically does in Acts chapter 7, it's so beautiful, it's so amazing, he brings the Jewish leaders back to um, back into the past, back into the history of the nation, and he basically records the history of Israel and shows them how God has been with them, how God has lavished his care upon them, how God has blessed them and made them a nation to reflect his very character, to reflect his glory. And as they are listening to this powerful presentation, this powerful arguments of, 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 of Stephen, they become more and more enraged. Their heart is hardened. And take notice what happens in verse 51. Acts chapter 7 and verse 51. Here Stephen is addressing them as he sees that they are turning away 
from God more and more, and they're not listening to the words that are now coming to them through the Holy Spirit, he addresses them in a very strong manner, and he says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who before, who fore told the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers, who have rejected, who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. Now look at verse 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth, but he, being filled by the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord, and they cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. So here we read about the stoning of Stephen. Stephen is stoned when he is bearing this testimony of how God had led the Israelites, had led the Jews throughout history. And here he is dying, the first martyr, the first Christian martyr, Stephen. And this marked the end of the 70-week prophecy of Daniel 9, the 490 years which terminated in 34 AD at the stoning of Stephen. Now there's something interesting that happened here on this scene, because as they are casting stones at this, uh, at this, this follower of Jesus, Stephen, he prays a prayer. He prays a prayer, and we read about that in verse 40, 59. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, listen to the prayer of Stephen, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Do not charge them with their sin. That prayer was heard, my friends, because there was a man standing there watching that scene by the name of Saul. And we know the story of Saul. Shortly after that, he was on, on his way to Damascus to persecute the Christians in Damascus. And there was a light from heaven. Jesus himself stood in that road, stood on, that way, on, his, on his path. And Paul, Saul encountered Jesus. He was knocked off his horse. He was blinded. And the only direction he could look was within himself. He realized his sin. He realized his weakness. And he clung to Jesus, his Savior, and he became Paul, the mighty, mighty apostle, mighty apostle that wrote the majority of the New Testament. And so we have this transitional scene there at the stoning of Stephen, where the prayer of Stephen is heard because Saul becomes Paul, he becomes a mighty apostle. The prayer of Stephen, my friends, was answered. I think many times about the meeting that must take place in heaven when Stephen will meet with, with, with Paul. Can you imagine? You know, and, and, and Stephen must be surprised. The last thing he saw was, 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 was Saul looking on to him as, as, as he's being put to death, as, as stones are being cast at him. And now he sees Paul in heaven. There must be some explanation to be done there. Stephen knows his prayer has been heard. And Paul becomes the mighty apostle of the New Testament and the gospel goes to the Gentiles. You see, now the gospel not only is preached to the Jews, but it goes to the Gentiles, and very sadly, the Jews as a nation rejected the invitation of God. Now, that doesn't mean that there were not individual Jews that took on the message. Certainly there were. We read about that in, in, the, um, in the course of the New Testament. There were many Jews that became faithful followers of Jesus. Um, but the majority and the nation as a whole rejected the invitation. And so in seven, in, in, after the 70 weeks terminated in 34 AD, the Jews as a nation were no longer under the, under the direct control or the direct um, blessings of the Lord as a nation. As a matter of fact, the, the, the fig tree of the parable in Luke chapter 13 was cut down. There was no fruit to be found and the tree was cut down. Individual Jews still accepted the message and became powerful uh, followers of Jesus, and they became part of what we now call spiritual Israel, those that are sons and daughters of Abram by faith. That's the spiritual Israel we read about in the New Testament.
Now, the parable of the fig tree is not only pointing to the Jewish nation. The parable of the fig tree, I believe, has also an application for you and for me this morning. As a matter of fact, the, power, the parable of the fig tree is not just talking about literal Israel. I believe it's very specifically talking about spiritual Israel as well. You see, we, um, as followers of Jesus, claim to be part of spiritual Israel. As a matter of fact, you can read there in the book of Galatians how Paul says, if you, are, if, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are a son and a daughter of Abraham by faith. You become part of the spiritual Israel, which is also represented in that fig tree. Sad to say, the spiritual Israel also many times does not bear the fruit that God expects it to bear. And yet, Jesus and the Father are one in their interest in the spiritual Israel of today, and they are pouring out the Holy Spirit. They are working in the lives of individuals to make them bear the fruit that they are called to bear to the glory of God. As a matter of fact, there is a story also found in the book of Daniel about a man that was called to bear fruit to the glory of God, but that would rather bring glory to himself. And that's the story of Nebuchadnezzar. Some of you will be familiar with this story. It's found in Daniel chapter 4, and I invite you to turn there. The book of Daniel in chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, mighty, mighty king, most likely the mightiest person living on the earth at that time, he had a dream. And God was working upon the life of this king in a marvelous way. You read Daniel chapter 1 and chapter 2 and chapter 3, and there are these instances where God is really reaching out to this heathen king. And in chapter 4, it kind of comes to a climax. In chapter 4, this king of Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar, he has a dream. And in this dream, he sees this huge big tree. Interesting to think about that in light of the parable of the fig tree. He sees this huge big tree, and then in the, in, in the same chapter you read about what happened to that tree. The tree, this glorious beautiful tree, was cut down. And, and in the morning, Nebuchadnezzar wakes up and he's wondering what, what this dream means. And so he calls the prophet Daniel, and Daniel comes and explains the dream. And take notice of Daniel chapter 4 and verse 23. Look at this. Here is the explanation of the dream, and it says, And inasmuch as the king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, Chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave its stump and roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field, let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let him graze with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the degree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the King. They shall drive you from men. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make you eat grass like oxen. They shall wet you with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over you, till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. So the dream is a represent in the dream the tree is a representation of king nebuchadnezzar and the fact that he brought glory to himself rather than giving glory to god resulted in him losing the kingdom for seven times or seven years as a matter of fact it's interesting when we come to the words of daniel that he adds to the interpretation of the dream he gives kind of a he wants to motivate the king to, to turn his way to turn to god fully and he says in verse 30 uh, 26 and 27 the following look at this Inasmuch as they gave the command to leave the stump and the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you after you come to know that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. So Daniel the prophet, after giving the interpretation of the dream, he adds his advice to the king. He says, please turn around, come back to God, give God the glory. He has given you this kingdom, give him the glory. Maybe this, prop, this prophetic dream will not come to pass if you turn your heart to the Lord. What happened, the sad story, is that Nebuchadnezzar, he held on to the fact that it was his kingdom and he brought glory to himself. And at the end of a certain period, 
the dream came to pass. As a matter of fact, it's interesting. It was at the end of 12 months, at the end of one year. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. The king spoke saying, is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you. Imagine, while the word was in the king's mouth, he is walking there, I can see it before me, he's walking there on the walls, uh, on, on, on the top of the walls of his palace, he's looking down upon this beautiful city, and he is saying, this is my kingdom, it's the glory, it belongs to me. And at that very moment, the kingdom is taken from him. As a matter of fact, you read it, you read on in the chapter, and it talks about that he was driven from man, and he lived like a beast for seven years in the fields. After that, the kingdom was given back to him. And basically, the beautiful ending of the story is that it resulted in the conversion of Nebuchadnezzar, this king. He gave glory to God in the end. Praise the Lord for that. But what we see in this dream is that the king was investigated. His life was investigated for 12 months, for one year. And after the year was finished and he still brought glory to himself, the kingdom was taken from him. Now, in the book of Daniel, we read about an investigative judgment. As a matter of fact, the book of Daniel and the prophecies of the book of Daniel reveal that we are living in what we call the investigative judgment period of time. Um, as a matter of fact, you can find it all through the book of Daniel. The most known chapter regarding the investigative judgment is Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. And many of you will... Um, will be familiar with this passage, um, Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14, it says, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. For 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. And uh, many people have wondered as to what that means. What does it mean for the sanctuary to be cleansed after 2,300 days? Well, if you look at the prophecy of Daniel chapter 8, and you connect it with the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9, you see that those two prophecies belong together. And the beginning date of Daniel chapter 9, the command to rebuild Jerusalem in 457 BC, is also the beginning date for the prophecy of Daniel 8 regarding the cleansing of the sanctuary. And so you take 2,300 years and you count from that date, 457 BC, and you end up in the year 1844. And in 1844, the sanctuary in heaven began to be cleansed. This is not talking about the earthly sanctuary here. It's talking about the heavenly sanctuary where Jesus Christ, after his death and resurrection, ascended to minister. And you can read in the book of Hebrews about Jesus Christ as our high priest ministering in the heavenly sanctuary for you and for me. In 1844, he moved into what we call the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to make atonement for us. And during this time, our lives are being investigated. Our lives are being investigated and Jesus Christ is doing everything in his power as our high priest to make us recipients of his blessings so that we can put his character on display in this world so that we can bear fruit to his glory. And so this all connects with the parable that we read about in Luke chapter 13, the parable of the fig tree and the rest of the story. A very simple teaching, and yet it has profound, uh, deep uh, meaning when you connect it with the prophecies in God's word. The parable of the fig tree, the fig tree did not bear fruit. The owner says, cut it down. Uh, the, vine dress, uh, the, the dresser of the tree says, give it one more year. I'll, 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 I'll fertilize it. I'll nourish it. I'll do everything in my strength that it will bear fruit. And then the parable is finished. We don't know the rest of the story. The parable applies to the nation of Israel in its first application. Israel as a nation did not bear the fruits that God expected it to bear. And so ultimately, at the end of the 70-week prophecy of Daniel chapter 9, the fig tree was cut down. There were individual Jews that accepted the call and became powerful disciples of Jesus, but the nation, as a nation, they rejected the invitation of God. The second application of the parable of the fig tree is spiritual Israel, you and me. And it is an unfinished parable because the parable needs to be finished by you and by me.
We are spiritual Israel. God has lavished his blessings upon us. He has given us his word. He has led us into this movement of prophecy. He is working in your life. And the question is, are you bearing fruit to the glory of God? We are living now in the antitypical day of atonement. We are living in the time that we are being investigated. Just like Nebuchadnezzar was investigated for one year, and at the end of the year he says, it's my glory, and the kingdom was taken from him. To who do you give the glory in your life? Are you in the time of the investigative judgment living to the glory of God? As a matter of fact, it's so fascinating that in the book of Daniel, every single chapter leading up to Daniel chapter 8, 14 has an investigative judgment. Let's look at that quickly. Daniel is a fascinating story. I've always loved to, 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 to preach on, on this book. It's one of my favorite books along with the book of Revelation. I like to travel and teach on prophecy. Um, for, for many years, I was studying this prophecy in Daniel chapter 8 about the investigative judgment and what is going on in the, in the heavenly sanctuary. And suddenly it dawned on me that the whole history of this prophet, the whole historic section of this book, which basically is the first six chapters of the book of Daniel, the story of the prophet and his friends in Babylon is really a type of what is going on right now with God's people in the end of time. In every chapter, in every story through the book of Daniel, you will find the investigative judgment. In other words, the parable of the fig tree uh, repeated, this story repeated. Uh, if you go to Daniel chapter 1, we're not going to read through all these chapters, but I'm just going to kind of uh, encapture the story for you. And many of you will be familiar with the story. Maybe some of you aren't. Um, you can read these stories uh, later. I encourage you to do so. In Daniel chapter 1, you have the story of um, Daniel with his friends coming to Babylon. And the first test that they receive in Babylon is based on appetite. It's based on food. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, the, the wine and the meat of the king is offered to Daniel and his friends, and they, they refuse to eat of it. They know it's going to pollute their bodies. They know that their bodies is a temple of the Holy Spirit. They want to remain uh, sober. They want to remain, remain clear-minded so that they can give glory to God. And so they ask the person in charge of, of, of the food, they say, you know, can you give us vegetables to eat? Can you give us water to drink? Can you give us healthy food, and they receive that for a period of 10 days. There is an investigation going on during those 10 days. And at the end of those 10 days, they are judged to be more healthy than the others that ate of the king's table. Investigation, judgment, and Daniel and his friends pass the judgment. Daniel chapter 2, you have the story of, of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, having a dream. And in his dream, he sees this, this image uh, made of a, a head of gold, a chest and arms of silver, thigh of brass, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay. And, and it's a prophetic dream. Uh, this metal man with different, uh, made up of different metals is a representation of the kings and kingdoms that would come and fall from Babylon to the end of time. It's a fascinating prophecy in Daniel chapter 2. We don't have time to go into the depth of that prophecy. But in the story of Daniel chapter 2, uh, Nebuchadnezzar wakes up in the morning and he can't remember the details of this dream, but he, know, he knows that he's, he's dreamt something of uttermost importance. And so he gathers together his wise men and he says, uh, tell me what I dreamt last night and give me the interpretation of that dream. They cannot do so, and so enraged that they cannot come with the dream and the interpretation, they, he passes a death degree upon all the wise men in Babylon. Now, Daniel, under God's providence, was one of those wise men, and so his life is in danger, and he asks of the king to give him time. Now, that time that Daniel received is an investigative time. The king is seeing if he's going to become, if he's going to be able to pass the judgment that has now been uh, cast upon the wise men. Daniel goes home, he prays to God the Father, and, 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 and his heavenly Father bestows upon him the knowledge of the dream and its interpretation during the night, during a dream that he had in the night. The next day he goes to the king, he explains the prophecy, explains the dream and the interpretation, and Daniel passes the judgment. You see, and again, an investigative judgment. You go to Daniel chapter 3. In Daniel chapter 3, you read about the friends of Daniel um, that are called to the plains of Dura, where the king of Babylon has raised this huge uh, image of gold, and everyone is required to bow down and worship that image. As a matter of fact, if they will not worship that image, they will be cast into a fiery furnace. There's an investigation, 
and there's a judgment. Now, the friends of Daniel, they do not bow down to that image. And they are cast into the fiery furnace, but you can read what happens. Christ himself, the Son of God, appears in their midst, and the only thing that burns is the rope that bound their hands together. So they are set free. They are investigated, and they pass the judgment. In Daniel chapter 4, well, we studied it already. We looked at it already. There you have the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. Again, he is investigated for a period of 12 months, but he does not pass the judgment. And so we have illustrations in the book of Daniel in the three first chapters of how God's people are to live in the end of time in order to pass the judgment. But we also have illustrations in the book of Daniel of what we are not to do because what, if we follow in the footsteps of Nebuchadnezzar, if we follow in the footsteps of this king, we will not pass the judgment if we bring glory to ourselves rather than bear the glory and the fruits of God. In Daniel chapter 5 is another illustration of a king that failed to pass the judgment. You read about the king of Belshazzar, which was the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, that held this great big feast. And during that feast, he took the sacred vessels of the temple of Jerusalem. And he is holding this riotous feast when uh, the, the, the hand of an angel writes on the wall, mena mena tekel upasin, which means you have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. You have been weighed in the balance, investigation. You have been found wanting judgment. Investigative judgment in Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 6, maybe the most familiar story that we find in the book of Daniel, Daniel in the lion's den. Now remember that before Daniel was, was cast into the lion's den, you read about the law that was passed that no one could, could worship anyone else except the king for a period of 30 days. 30 days of investigation. Daniel worships the king of the universe, the heavenly father. During that time, he's investigated, he is judged, he is cast into the lion's den, but he passes the judgment. Amen? So in the entire historic section of the book of Daniel, from chapter 1 to chapter 2 to chapter 3 to chapter 4 to chapter 5 to chapter 6, we have an investigative judgment. And we have examples of how we pass that judgment, and we have examples of how we don't. And then you come to the prophetic section of the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 7, this incredible prophecy, Daniel 8, the incredible prophecy, and Daniel 9, leading to the investigative judgment at the end of time. According to Bible prophecy, since 1844, we are living in this, what we call, antitypical day of atonement. We are living in this investigative judgment period. We are the fig tree, spiritual Israel. And the vine dress or the dresser and the owner of the fig tree are looking if we are going to bear fruit to the glory of God or we're going to be, bear fruit to our own glory. And that's why we have these powerful stories in the book of Daniel that are really illustrations of how you and I in the end of time can put our faith in God and how he can work in us to put on display the very character of God and how we can pass the final judgment that is going on in the heavenly sanctuary. And so this parable of the fig tree is really a parable that each one of us needs to finish. Let's go back and read it again, Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, the parable of the fig tree, verse 6 to verse 9. He also spoke this parable, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and found none. Cut it down, why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit, well, but if not, after that, you can cut it down. That's the end of the parable. The, the rest of the story is not known. We know the rest of the story for the nation of Israel, but we don't know the rest of the story regarding spiritual Israel. You and I are part of spiritual Israel. You and I are called to be a tree bearing fruit to the glory of God. We cannot bear fruit of our own. You know, we have nothing to boast of. We have nothing to glory of. We are weak and frail. But when we surrender ourselves to Jesus Christ, when we are uh, broken on the rock, Jesus, then he will be able to work in us and he will be able to put his character on display in our lives. Turn to Psalm chapter 1. I love this psalm, the very first psalm, Psalm chapter 1, and we read about God's 
people, God's called children that are represented by a tree. Psalms chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, and the Bible said, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the, street, in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Look at verse 3, beautiful description. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Oh, my friends, that's my prayer for you and for me, that we will be that tree that bears fruit to the glory of God. It is a tree that is planted by the rivers of waters. Water in the Bible is also a symbol of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is that which fertilizes our lives, that which gives strength to our lives, that we can give glory to God, that we can put on display His character, not because of our own strength and might, but because of the power of God that works in and through us. You know, that word in the parable, that two-letter word, if, has such a great implication. In Luke chapter 13 in the parable, look at what it says there in verse 8 and 9. Luke chapter 13, back to the parable. And in verse 8 and 9, the Bible says, But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well, but if not, after that you can cut it down. That word if carries great implications. The rest of the story depends on a two-letter word, and that's the word if. The outcome is not given, for it is dependent on our lives during this investigation. If, it speaks of potential, it speaks of possibilities, it speaks of chances. The outcome could be this or that. It all depends on actions that are determined by choices that we make. Choices whether we will bring glory to ourselves or bring glory to God. If we will bear fruit for our own prospering in this world, in this life, or it will bear fruit to the prospering of the kingdom of God. You know, there are verses in Scripture that reveal the, uh, the power of that two-letter word, F. Let me read a couple of, you, of, of them to you. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse, verse 14, it says, If my people which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land if my people pray. And then it says in, verse, in, in Matthew chapter 17 and verse 20, it says, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible to you. If you have faith, nothing will be impossible to you. If you are called by my name and turn to me, I will heal your land. Listen to what it says in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 17. If thou wilt, if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. If any man open the door. Mark chapter 9 verse 23. If thou believest, all things are possible to him that believeth. You see the great implications of that little tiny two-letter word, if? If you pray, I will heal the land. If you believe, all things are possible. If you open the door, I will come into you. If. If you bear fruit, the tree will remain. If we give God glory in our lives, he will work through and in us to finish his work. You know, sometimes we... Uh, or many times when we read books, uh, we want to know the, 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 the last chapter, we want to know the, the outcome of the story, we want to know the, the final scenes, and sometimes it's very tempting when you're reading a book to go to the end and just read, you know, the last chapter. I know you shouldn't do that, but it's very easy to do that. When you look at the story that God has been telling throughout the ages, and you take the Bible and you look from Genesis to Revelation, it's one 
incredible story that God is telling about the lives of individuals from the creation to the very consummation of all things when Christ returns. There's this incredible story that is being told. As a matter of fact, there's, there's such a beautiful structure in the Word of God. You look at the two verse, first chapters in Genesis and it deals with a perfect world and a, and a, and a perfect uh, man and, and this perfect relationship between God and man. There's no sin, no suffering, uh, nothing. No evil, no sin. And, and, and in that perfect world, we read about man bearing the image of God. And then you read about the fall in Genesis chapter 3 and a total different world comes on the scene. And from Genesis chapter 3 all the way to Revelation chapter 20, you read about this great controversy that has been raged on this planet. And then the last two chapters of the Bible, Revelation chapter 21 and 22, again deal with a restored world, a restored earth, where there is, again, no sin, no suffering, no pain, and where there is perfect harmony between God and man. And so you have two chapters in the beginning and two chapters in the very end. And we are now living between these chapters. You and I are in this very story, and we are in the parable, and it's an unfinished story, it's an unfinished parable. The parable of the fig tree, the rest of the story. What is the rest of the story for you and for me? I pray that the rest of the story will be that we will bear fruit to God's glory, that He will be able to do in us what He has longed to do in us, and that is restore us in the image of God. In the beginning, God said, let us make man in our image. That is the purpose of man, to, bear, to, to reflect the character of God. That's what man was created for. The image and character of God has been lost through sin, but the purpose of God is to restore that image in you and in me so that we can again be the people that he has ordained us to be for such a time as this. Many times when I think about heaven, I think about individuals that I want to meet there. You know, you think about stories that you've read in the Old Testament that, you've, that have inspired you, um, characters that you would like to meet and converse with, and I'm sure that each of you can think about certain Bible characters that you would just love to meet in heaven. Uh, I want to tell you this this morning that there are many characters in the Bible that will want to meet with you. Can you imagine the characters in the Bible that are thinking about the final people that lived just prior to the second coming of Christ? There were prophets that foretold these events, like the prophet Daniel, uh, like John that wrote the book of Revelation. They were writing about this generation that would live in the end of time just prior to the second coming of Jesus. They were writing about that investigative judgment that would go on in the heavenly sanctuary just prior to the coming of Jesus. I am sure that they will want to meet that generation that reflected the image of God, that put on display the character of God. And I pray that they will meet you and meet me on that day. So I pray that we will be able to finish this story and that it will be a happy end, not because we can make it a happy end, not because we can you know, just do better and bear fruit in our lives, because in ourselves there is no strength to do that, but it's in the strength of the blood of Jesus. It's in the strength of the power of Prince Emmanuel that we put our trust in Christ and that he works in us that which we cannot do for ourselves. So that if this is your desire, I just invite you to bow with me in prayer as we give our hearts to the Lord this morning. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for the study we could have this morning. We want to thank you, Lord, for working in our lives. And we have all come to a moment in our experience that we just sense that we need you so much more, Lord, because in ourself we can do nothing and we need your strength to carry us through. Lord, I believe that each of us can find ourselves in the parable of the fig tree. Uh, many times we have failed to bear forth fruit. I know that I have failed, but Lord, we, we do not give up. We do not remain uh, down, but we get up again and we believe, Lord, that you can do in us what you have promised and we cling to the promise in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6 that says that you that begun a good work in us will also complete it. Father we believe that you can uh, bring the fruits of righteousness into our life and that we can be a generation that will bear your image and that will put on display your amazing character. Thank you Father for the lessons of Scripture and the stories of Scripture that resonate with us. May they speak to us this morning. May they speak to us as we continue to study them. And thank you for being with us, Lord, for we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.